Dora and Hyman grew up in neighboring shtetl. As their relationship blossomed, the world around them withered. Europe was in turmoil and on the brink of World War I. Hyman was drafted into the Tsar's army, a death sentence for most. Faced with a life-or-death decision, he left his home and immigrated to the United States. Dora stayed behind in Poland. He traveled in steerage with his family. His mother did not survive the journey. She succumbed to appendicitis, which she developed on the boat trip to America. After my father left for the United States, about six months later, my mother realized that she obviously really loved him, and she came to the United States to look for him. And she didn't want to show him that she loved him or missed him, so she just walked up and down his block. And he was nearsighted, so he came down one day, and she's standing there and smiling, and he walked right past her because he was so nearsighted. She says, oh my God, she started to cry, and the next day she decided to go back. And when he came down from his house and walked down the fire steps past her, she bumped into him. And he yelled, stop, she must, stop, she must, cause to die. In other words, Dora, what are you doing here? never to forget the Holocaust. But we often overlook the life and story of the Jewish people of Europe before their annihilation by the Nazis. For hundreds of years, Poland was home to the largest and most significant Jewish community in the world. Shtetls popped up throughout Eastern Europe and flourished until the partitions of Poland by Austria, Prussia, and the Russian Empire in the 18th century. Deep-rooted in the religion and the culture of Judaism, we imagine these small villages to be like what we've seen in the film and musical productions of Fiddler on the Roof. But the Jewish world before the Holocaust and during the interwar years was diverse. The people were every shade of religious devotion and shtetl life was evolving. While the older generation retained traditional customs and values, the younger generation was exploring the worlds of politics, science, and the arts. They were everything from farmers to government officials. They played music, relaxed after a hard day's work, and laughed with their friends. They were normal people just living their lives, not so different from us today. Eventually, for many though, the pogrom, repressive anti-Semitic laws, and the outbreak of the First World War was too much. Many came to America striving for a better life. Every penny they earned was saved to bring their families left behind to the United States. Between 1881 and 1914, over two million Jews left their homes and family in the Russian Empire. They emigrated to Western Europe and America in one of the largest migrations in recorded history. vivid dream. She was psychic that way, that her parents and her siblings were all going to be killed in Poland. And they never saw my brother or sister arrive, and she went to borrow money from all her different cousins so she could take her children to Poland. 
my sister Joyce refused to go, and she stayed home with my father so he wasn't alone. We left the last week of June, and we came home the day after Labor Day to start school again. I was 10 years old. We traveled to Europe on a big German ship called the Bremen, but I was seasick from the minute the ship started to move. Our first stop was in Breslau in Germany. The sister, my Aunt Sally, lived there with my great aunt and uncle, who were very wealthy horse merchants. My mother was told when she got off the boat, get into a taxi and just tell the taxi driver, Kurlinda Estate, and we went there with that in Abbott. He had about 20 stables that were at one time filled with horses that he sold, or they were racetrack horses, I don't know exactly. But there wasn't a horse in the stable that the German government had confiscated all his horses. When we came into the house, my aunt said to my mother, do not speak politics in front of the servants. So there obviously was uh, some kind of a unrest or problem or whatever you want to call it. All I remember is that there were a lot of little boys walking around in brown uniforms, and to me it looked like Boy Scouts. And one issue I remember, we got on a bus, my mother was in two seats with my aunt Sally, and Jerry and I were sitting right in front of them and two German women got on the bus and they walked up to me and Jerry and they said, a house, a house, that means get out or get off. And my brother Jerry said, no way. He said, there was six over there, go sit. And my aunt Sally poked us and she said, get up, get up. They used to say, the blonde is Shegetzishigda, meaning the blonde Gentile is, is here because my father thought he was outwitting them by riding his horse and buggy to the outside of the village and walking into my mother's village thinking he was fooling my grandfather that he walked from one village to the other. Around 1820, a Jewish community was established in Stuttgart. Jews were the majority in all branches of industry. They dealt in horse trading, shoemaking, and tailoring. All tinsmiths and barbers were Jews. The local government had 24 counselors. Of these, 16 were Jews and 8 were Poles. There were private religious schools, public educational institutions, and Jewish children even studied at the Polish trade school. There was a drama circle, political groups, and a strong Zionist movement in Stuttgart. The community worked together to survive. The people thought nothing could ever stop the development of social and cultural life in their shtetl. When we left Germany, we took the railroad to Poland 
and the little village that we were going to was called Stuttgart. We, we got off the train with the big trunk and we were waiting for my grandfather to come with the horse and buggy and pick us up. And a young woman passed my mother and she says to her in Polish, can you please tell me the time? And my mother picked up her hand to look at her watch and she burst out laughing. And she says to my brother and I, and she says, children, I remember, I understood what she asked me, but she says, I can't answer her. And she picked up her hand and she showed her the wristwatch, laughing hysterically that she understood part of herself, that she understood the Polish. And my grandfather met us with a horse and buggy, and they never saw us. They were totally overcome and crying. I met all my cousins and my mother's siblings, my uncle Lubin and my three aunts. As soon as we got into the house, my grandfather ran to the barn to milk the cow so he could bring us fresh milk. And you wouldn't believe this, but the milk was bubbling like it was just boiled. And of course, I used to pasteurize milk in the United States. So I don't have to tell you the outcome of the fresh milk from the cow. And no toilet paper in the yard house. My mother was reading a series uh, in the uh, Jewish newspaper. And every week we got a package of newspaper from New York. And the first package that arrived, my mother put a big nail in the yard house. And she ripped up the newspaper except for what she was reading put the torn newspaper on a nail in the outhouse, so we had toilet paper. And the first Saturday that I was in the outhouse and I ripped off a piece of paper, one of my little cousins ran screaming, Zadie, Zadie, the American Catholic in Papier of Shabbos that saying the American Zadie's grandpa. Grandpa, grandpa, the American ripped the paper on the Sabbath. And he didn't say a word to me. I don't know what he said to her. We saw poverty. I can't begin to tell you. There was no running water. There was no bathing. If it was a warm day, you went to the lake and you went swimming to wash yourself in the lake. My grandfather used to have a glass of uh, tea, pour it out in the garden, put the dirty glass back in the cabinet, and the same thing with the dishes they used. I remember my grandmother taking the silverware and putting it up and down in the dirt in the garden and wiping it off like it was scouring powder. My uncle Reuben, my mother's younger brother, knew that there was such a thing as faucets in America with running water. So he bought this cabinet that had a little faucet on it. You put water into the top of the cabinet, so we had a sink with running water. He was so thrilled that he bought it for us, but he would go every day to the center of the little village where there was a big well, and people would come with their pails and fill their pails up with water and carry it back to the house. Every time I walked in the street, people ran down from the houses and they would put their hands through my long curls. I wore Shirley Temple curls and they used to say in Yiddish, this is the way they wear the hair in America. I say talk in the hall in America.
And it was a very, very sad, a very thrilling time of my life. But of course, my mother's dream came true, that a family of 26 people were all killed in the Holocaust, all of them, except her younger brother, who she managed to scrape together money from all the relatives here and sent him to uh, Israel, which was then called Palestine. So I had an uncle and an aunt and cousins in, in Israel, and uh, but all my family from Poland was, uh, was gone in the Holocaust. And I said, I'll never forget it as long as I live, was my grandfather saying goodbye to us. I never saw a man cry and cry like a baby, like a little boy. He had his face covered with his hands and he was sobbing hysterically because he was saying goodbye. When the Nazis first entered the shtetl in 1939, they stayed for two weeks, burned down the old synagogue, and murdered 300 Jewish men. The Germans relinquished control to the Soviets until 1941, when they returned and a ghetto was designated in Stuttgart. The remaining men, the sick from the hospital, the beloved Rabbi Efron, and the elderly were taken to the Jewish cemetery in group. There, they were cruelly murdered by the Germans together with some Poles who joined in on the slaughter. They only let women and children, ten tailors, a few craftsmen, and those who smuggled their way into the ghetto. They lived in crowded conditions. They had little food, clothes, and no wood to heat their houses. Many died in the harsh conditions. The Stuchin Ghetto was liquidated on November 2nd, 1942, and the remaining 200 Jews were taken to the death camps at Auschwitz and Treblinka, where Dora's remaining family was murdered. My mother said, children, kiss the ground. And uh, when we got home, my father says to her, Dora, is the cheese the way I remember it? And I remember she vividly said, Jaime, nothing is the way you remember it. 